Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Brent, for um, inviting me to be here. I'm just delighted. Um, I'm also extremely pleased that I've brought two important people in my life with me. Uh, my son, Alex, uh, came um, and is thereby foregoing his university graduation ceremony tomorrow. Um, and my oldest friend, uh, Gunnar Samuelson, who lives in Inshipping, um, uh, came. Uh, Forty years ago this summer, he and I took a uh, road trip to Mexico and Canada and the coast of California and lots of national parks in between, and it was an experience that was a lasting bond. He's my oldest friend. Well, I, I'm just thrilled to be here and to, to see all of you. Um, you know, a thousand years ago, the greatest travelers in the world were the Vikings. And you are the descendants of the Vikings, and very likely are world travelers yourselves. I expect several of you have been to the United States. Maybe you've been to Chicago. Maybe you've even been to a suburb of Chicago called Batavia. And if you were in Batavia, you almost certainly saw uh, the Fermi Lab. Um, now, if you weren't a, a physicist going to, that, going to that research center with its 26-mile um, um, track for particle acceleration, um, you might have at least noticed the bison. They keep a large herd of bison at uh, the Fermi Lab, and you wonder why. This is a particle physics science laboratory. Why in the world would they have a herd of bison on the campus? Well, they're there for symbolic reasons. For the same reason that for 25 years, the bison was on the nickel coin of the United States and still is today on the $50 gold, gold coin. Um, Fermi Lab's first director was Robert Wilson, he and he was from a town. He was born in the town of Frontier, in southwestern Wyoming. He was the one who insisted that they have the buffalo herd there. Um, but Fermi Lab sees itself on the frontier of discovery. And this is a very strong um, uh, intellectual magnet, and it has been for an awfully long time. Um, you know Willem Moberg um, and his... his uh, novels about the emigrants who are your, are your descendants or your relatives in Minnesota, among other places. Um, the idea of people moving into a new area that was open to opportunity changed them. And that's what historian Frederick Jackson Turner said when he delivered a speech in 1893 called uh, The Significance of the Frontier in American History. He said that this experience of moving into new territory, finding new opportunities, leaving behind old traditions, uh, not only made important new discoveries, it resulted in some undesirable characteristics, too. Um, Americans love freedom of opportunity, but we also love violence. Um, and those are both uh, consequences of the frontier experience. Well, you now are pioneers. You've heard from the scouts earlier in this talk, earlier in this program, uh, the, the scientists who have been out exploring and telling you things. You're the people in the covered wagons moving out into the new territory where who knows what you'll find. But you can be sure there'll be lots to find. That's um, Frederick Jackson Turner, the historian who wrote that, that piece. Um, and there are new frontiers in the stars, in the unexplored depths of the ocean, and in ourselves. And perhaps the ultimate frontier is self-knowledge. Actually, all knowledge is self-knowledge. You may not have all knowledge, but all knowledge that you have is self-knowledge. Um, well, I'll propose a frontier thesis of the brain. No, actually, I'll propose that there ought to be a frontier thesis of the brain, and I'll let you fill in the, fill in the blanks. Um, 
But first, though, I want to explore what I mean by the molecular inference of wisdom. Uh, Laurie already took my line. Uh, <laughs> that's good, that's good. Uh, wisdom is an observable human trait, um, or at least it always has been since the time of Confucius. Um, the interesting thing about Confucius, besides this ancient source of wisdom, is that he has the oldest human genealogy. This is the oldest recorded human genealogy through 80 generations coming from him to this boy born on Taiwan in 2006. And wouldn't it be interesting to know um, if any of Confucius's talent for wisdom was transmitted through 80 generations to the, to the present. Um, besides being observable, wisdom is highly distributed among all people. Now, Rene Descartes made a joke of this. Uh, he said that because any trait that is widely distributed among all people actually means that no significant amount of it is accumulated in any one person. Well, I think that's probably true. Uh, everybody's capable of wisdom. Uh, I'm not sure I know anybody who is excessively pathologically wise. Um, um, but in any case, we know that it's highly variable, but it comes in two flavors. There's the individual type of wisdom, and then there's the collective cultural wisdom. Um, on the low side of individual wisdom is the folk expression, common sense. And one of the greatest purveyors of this form was Benjamin Franklin. In the utilitarian pamphlets he published between 1732 and 1758, known as Poor Richard's Almanac. Among other things, he had sayings like, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. He said that drink doesn't drown care, but waters it and makes it grow. He had dozens of these sayings that he then compiled into the 13 virtues, which were, since he was not a uh, traditional religious believer, he used the 13 vir virtues as a substitute for the Ten Commandments, for, every, for wisdom in everyday life. Um, but wisdom also has um, a higher order of things, um, and such as inspiration and intuition, in insight and enchantment. 19th century phren phrenologists, who were the forerunners of today's neurobiologists, supposed that many human traits could be mapped specifically uh, to a location in the brain. They produced ceramic models um, with the traits mapped out. Now, I've, because I'm a museum curator, I've seen dozens of um, uh, phrenology heads, but I've never seen one that mapped wisdom. And I suppose that's because the phrenologists had no idea of DNA. They had little understanding of what, I guess, historically is called the reptilian brain, the lower brain, or uh, the monkey brain, the middle brain, or the human higher brain. Um, they couldn't have realized how a molecule could have evolved into um, consciousness, because they really had no... I'm maybe, maybe wrong about that. I was about to say they had no sense of evolution, but actually I think all people have had senses of evolution. It's evolution by natural selection that Darwin explained that was different from other interpretations. Um, natural selection exerts pressure on molecules, on tissues, on organs, in both the single self and collective humanity. Wisdom, then, has to be seen as a trait involving the entire brain. That's why you couldn't find it in any one location. It involves the, the, high, the entire brain with input from genes at one end and from the society at the other end. 
Uh, scientific inquiry, of course, has been a great source of wisdom. Um, this is your self-knowledge. You know when you go out and sunbathe that you live in a sun-centered um, solar system. Um, you owe that to Galileo. You know that you are a homo sapien. Maybe you owe that to um, Linnaeus. That doesn't look like the Linnaeus in the picture out, out front, but I'm told it is. Um, you, you have a philosophy of life. You know that you think. And that comes from Descartes. And you know about historic time, um, that we live in the Iron Age, the late Iron Age. Uh, we also know that there is a Jurassic Age, uh, if nothing else, because of Jurassic Park, the movie. Well, Jurassic Park comes from uh, Alexander von Humboldt. Um, science has been a great benefactor to, to humanity, but it's not infallible. As we can see in a 1927 United States Supreme Court case named Buck versus Bell. Uh, Carrie Buck um, and her mother, Emma, uh, lived in Augusta County, Virginia. Um, and her mother had a criminal record for prostitution. I think that could be exaggerated, just looking at the picture of her. Um, but she did have an arrest record. Um, and when Carrie was found to have given birth to an illegitimate child, Vivian is her name, um, she was charged under the Virginia Eugenics Law of 1925, and she was charged with feeble-mindedness. Um, and that law prescribed that people who were feeble-minded uh, should be um, appropriately adjusted by sterilization, either castration or neutering. Um, this, this law was the product of some of the most advanced scientific thinking of its time. The term was coined by Charles Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton. Um, and it meant well-born. Of course, it also implied that some people weren't so well-born. Um, the first people who really picked up on this were farmers and livestock breeders. And they began to suppose, um, under the influence of scientists, that people could be bred like livestock were bred. An American zoologist, Charles Davenport, uh, from the University of Chicago, became the leading proponent of eugenics policy in the United States. In 1910, he established the... Um, did that change? No. Ah, there it is. He established the Eugenics Record Office, which is up there. Um, in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Uh, it's one of the, the uh, landmarks of what's now known as the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which was one of the pioneering um, uh, research centers for genetics in the United States. Um, among Davenport's activities and the, uh, those of his assistant, who later became the director of the, the Eugenics Record Office, was to carry out field studies. And I'm sure you can't read the legend there, but this, this group of wealthy ladies from Long Island had gone out to the, the Pine Barrens of New Jersey to seek out this rustic gentleman, you can barely see him there, um, and discuss his heredity in trying to determine whether he and people like him, some people we might call hillbillies, um, were genetically fit or were unfit. They compiled all kinds of records that still exist. Um, they did actual scientific research. This is the, 
first field of hybrid corn grown anywhere in the world. And it was from scientific breeding, um, and they showed that you could make better corn by careful breeding. Uh, they also ran at several state fairs uh, something called the Fitter Families for Future Firesides competitions, uh, where families were evaluated, uh, mostly families uh, of northern European stock, which were considered to be the fittest, um, and those um, who were considered fit, like this particular family at the Iowa State Fair, um, would be given a trophy and um, they could hold it over their neighbors. Um, There we go. Um, Harry Laughlin wrote the model eugenic sterilization law in 1922 and aimed that at uh, the insane, idiots, imbeciles, and epileptics. And it became the Virginia law's uh, inspiration. Not stopping at that, the Virginia General Assembly also legislated its Racial Integrity Act, which forbade interracial marriage, marriages in Virginia until it was overturned in 1967. Under the sterilization law, Virginians performed 6,683 surgeries, including one Carrie Buck. Her case had gone from uh, county courts to state courts, eventually to the Supreme Court of the United States, where Associate Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes argued, or accepted the argument, I guess, um, that the state had an interest in uh, what we would call the gene pool. And he saw sterilization as being no different than vaccination against diseases. Um, this state interest overrode body privacy. And this wasn't overturned until the, the Supreme Court case of Roe versus Wade uh, that allowed the privacy of abortion. Um, Justice Holmes' um, memorable words in the case of Buck versus Bell. This is John Bell, um, the uh, head of the Virginia Colony for the Feeble-Minded. That's Kerry Buck. Uh, that's Oliver Wendell Holmes. And that's Virginia Governor Mark Warner in 2002 apologizing to the people of Virginia for this horrendous act. Um, the eugenics um, Um, the eugenics movement wasn't, combined, wasn't confined to Virginia or even to the United States. Many countries, including Canada, Japan, Belgium, Brazil, and Sweden, had laws that resulted in sterilization of people with psychiatric disorders. Eugenics became the foundation of Nazi Germany's race hygiene policies until it was... Until, and the ultimate destination for this line of scientific wisdom was to the gates of Auschwitz. Because race hygiene had been a rationale for genocide, eugenics gradually faded away, but slowly. Um, Virginia repealed its eugenic sterilization law in 1974. Sweden did so the following year. Ethnic cleansing is the little brother of racial hygiene, where limited numbers rather than full-blown genocide um, aims to drive certain populations out of, a, out of a society, as happened with the, the cannibal, cannibalization of Mbuti pygmies during the Congo War in 2003 and the South Sudan conflict between the Dinka and Nura peoples, which is going on today. Only superficially are these eugenic con, uh, conflicts but they follow in the wake of ideas that were once considered wise. Individual and cultural wisdom interact with each other, and while they seem to be at least qualitatively different, they have a common origin in our genomes. 
So let's look. Uh, let's begin looking for molecular inference there in the genome,、um, even though it involves enormous complexity.、Uh, the number of genes in the human genome is thought to be around 21,000 now, down from a generation ago when it was thought to be 100,000. My guess is that it will go back up close to 100,000 before、uh, it, the issue is resolved, because recently genes have been found to be nested in other genes. Um, maybe there'll be fewer than than twenty one thousand. Maybe a, a set for which there's no duplication. There, this is the simple essential set. But in any case, even though the genome has been、uh, sequenced and mapped,、um, we're only at the beginning of understanding what this really is and where it's it's going to go.、Um, but it's in any case, it's not. The finite number of genes that's important, but rather the epigenetic possibilities of combined genetic expressions that produce enormous possibilities. We're, we're talking about、um, hyper astronomical、um, uh, combinations of gene expressions resulting in proteins that approximate a number of. Ten to several million powers. It's infinite.、Uh, still, we can muse over the basic nature of the gene and of the neuron. A generation ago, British evolutionary biologist、uh, Richard Dawkins published a small and deceptively plain titled、uh, book called *The Selfish Gene*. In it, he argued that the gene, as, a, as the molecule that natural selection worked upon, was selfish about its survival. He didn't mean this in an anthropomorphic way, but rather that units of DNA competed with the fittest for a particular environment, prevailing and continuing on to the next generation. This is just classic Darwinism. The less fit perished. Or at least remain dormant until the environment changed. Dawkins has been vilified for claiming that the basic the basic trait of humanity is selfishness, but he also explained that nobody paid any attention to. I think that、um, in higher complexity, selfishness can become selflessness. In this sense,、um, the selfish gene comes very close to the eugenic definition、um, of well-born. About a decade after the selfish gene, geneticist Christopher Wills, that's the other fellow,、um, uh, at the University of California in San Diego,、uh, published a book titled "The Wisdom of the Gene." Like Dawkins, he didn't imply an anthropomorphic wisdom, but rather that the accumulated ability of genes to evolve in some cases and not evolve in others represents a fundamental wisdom. This, of course, happens in the context of cells, neurons, for our purposes, and it's possible that the neurons of the autonomic nervous system are better at not evolving. Because they're always on, maintaining blood pressure,、uh, respiration, and other things, while neurons of the frontal lobes are better at evolving for intellectual performance. Wise genes evolve into well genomes, which include well wise neurons. I'm using wellness and wisdom as interchangeable terms because that's the molecular inference. In 1958. Francis Crick gave us what is called the central dogma of molecular biology. That is, that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. We now know that this pathway is a two-way street, and、uh, almost daily, neuroscientists report congested traffic patterns in this pathway. Earlier this spring, for instance.、Um, The Phantom Consortium, headquartered in Japan, reported how expressions of 
the same gene differs according to tissue location. What varies is the point of messenger RNA where protein synthesis begins. The gene for the dopamine active transporter for, uh, protein, for example, is located on human chromosome 5 with 15 exons spanning 64,000 base pairs. Messenger RNA transcribes the gene, but the translation into protein can begin at different points, whether the transmission is taking place in the brain or someplace else like the kidney. Um, dopamine in the kidney is responsible for water absorption into the blood and is the key mechanism for hypertension. Mistranslations, polymorphisms, post-translational modifications such as methylation are possible causes of or contributors to bipolar disorder, depression, attention deficit hyperactivity syndrome. These conditions may inhibit wisdom, prevent it, direct it into a different pathway, or conceivably even promote it, as might have been the case with such depressives as Abraham Lincoln, Charles Dickens, and Leo Tolstoy, or bipolar sufferers such as Ludwig von Beethoven, Winston Churchill, and Isaac Newton. One, point about, one other point about uh, traffic patterns. Pyramidal neurons are cells found in the brain. And they were, are implicated in the cellular basis of wisdom. Santiago Ramon y Cajal, the, the Spanish pathologist, known as the father of neuroscience and winner of the 1906 Nobel Prize, discovered pyramid, pyramidal cells. There he is, in pyramidal cells. Um, and illustrated them as having a triangular-shaped axon with a long uh, dendrite extending from the apex um, with branches as it moves out and shorter base dendrites uh, with branches. Both dendrites have have spines which increase the impulse input from other cells while the axon serves for, for output. Um, over the past several years, uh, a group at Ludwig Macmil uh, Maximilian's University in Munich has figured out how the system works. Microtubes um, run the length of the dendrites to the axon and function as major highways. Motor proteins move molecular cargoes in one direction toward the axon tip, while another moves them in the opposite direction. The cargoes are ribonucleoproteins, which release their messenger RNA components at different uh, specific dendrite spines. These messenger molecules result in protein synthesis that reconfigure the shape of the synapse. Um, researchers at Ludwig Maximil Maximilian's University who gave us insights into the ribonucleoprotein traffic pattern relied on antibodies um, to sort out the proteins in those granules. This technique built on the work um, Gerald Edelman did at Rockefeller University in the 1960s, and for which he shared the 1972 Nobel Prize. Improving that antibodies are made of heavy, uh, variable heavy and light chains of amino acids, Edelman explained how the immune system worked. Further, with each cell division, slight changes in DNA uh, coding generated further variation which natural selection worked upon to achieve, in Edelman's words, not survival of the fittest, but survival on average of the fitter, which is a gradual, slower uh, rate of evolution. He might have spent the rest of his career in immunology, but the model of antibody, antibodies binding, binding to cer cell surface antigens took him down another path to the discovery of adhesion molecules on cell surfaces which allow cells to form tissues. As subsequent studies have shown, there are four major families of cell adhesion molecules, the largest being the 765 members of the immunoglobulin superfamily. 
which besides adhering cells to one another, carry out signaling for growth and development, including synapse formation. We are so sure that the brain is the seat of all mental processes that it's hard to imagine for most of history that wasn't true. Aristotle, contradicting both his teacher Plato and Hippocrates, proposed that the heart guided emotions and possibly the heart, liver, spleen, and kidneys were responsible for all things biological. His interpretation became known as the humoral theory, which held that a careful balance of four fluids, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile, explain wellness, and imbalance, illness. The brain in this scheme, in this scheme was simply a radiator that cooled the heart. And from this model comes the heart representing love, and sayings like, keep a cool head and gut intuition. Today, when we muse over melancholy, as Robert Burton did in 1621, in the first book about the anatomy of melancholy, we are using a word that literally means black bile. Humoral theory eventually eroded from explorations of the nervous system, the brain topography, and the mind's nature. But this was the philosophical map of the individual to the cosmos for 2,500 years. Now, fast forwarding to the present, we have two California psychiatrists publishing in the Archives of General Psychiatry in 2009 on the neurobiology of wisdom. This came closest to what I was looking for in preparing this talk. Um, and in this, uh, Thomas Meeks and Dilip Jest um, came to these conclusions. The prefrontal cor cortex figures prominently in several wisdom subcomponents, emotional regulation, decision-making, value relativism, um, primarily via top-down regulation of limbic and striatal regions. The lateral prefrontal co cortex facilitates calculated reason-based decision-making, whereas the medial prefrontal cortex is implicated in emotional balance and pro-social attitudes and behavior. It would be unfair to, to simply characterize this observation or these observations as old phrenology uh, put upon the new brain map. Um, um, in the way that people talk about, electricians talk about wall plugs. Um, the same way that neurobiologists talk about sections of the brain where you can identify traits. Well, electricity doesn't come from the wall plug. It comes from a power generating station at some distance through long transmission lines, changed through transformers, and into uh, that, that wall plug. Um, this does illustrate that from antiquity uh, to our planet, to our time, philosophers and scientists have argued over whether or not the, the brain and the mind were one and the same or separate, whether mental processes were localized or distributed over the whole brain, and whether or not neurons alone explain consciousness and concepts like wisdom. The context of wisdom and wellness that interests us the most uh, is the individual, specifically personality, because it's closest to our desire for self-knowledge. Personality is what distinguishes us from things. It's not a single quality, but an assemblage, and it's safe to say that personality emerges from brain chemistry in which neurotransmitters are the pace setters. Um, German-born pharmacologist Otto Lowy discovered the first uh, neurotransmitter in 1921. That's him over there. Um, uh, but interest grew in neurotransmitters after World War II, in part due to genocide committed by nerve gas. 
two neurotransmitters that seem uh, crucial to presenting wisdom are serotonin and dopamine, the former first explained by Betty Twarog at the Cleveland Clinic in 1953, and the latter by Arvid Carlson at Lund in 1957. Fifteen years of exploration followed Twarog's discovery, which turned out to be a route to socialization. In the brain, serotonin influences mood and plays a role in memory and learning. Too much of it has been linked to obsessive compulsive disorder and too little to depression. Um, the antidepressive drugs Prozac and Zoloft work by retarding serotonin reabsorption in neurons, which diminishes depression to the point of reversing it to a sense of well-being. This is a simple version of a protein which is generated in cells of the brain, brain stem. It does its work through other proteins, the serotonin transporter, which transmits the, extracell the extracellular space to at least seven different cell surface receptors and uh, monoamine oxidase A, which breaks down serotonin. Um, as with serotonin, too little or too much dopamine has behavioral consequences. A deficiency can freeze personality, and short of that, it can cause indecisiveness. The best known deficiency is the absence of dopamine in the substantia nigra, which causes Parkinson's disease. People with heightened dopamine levels are thought to be adventurous, thrill-seeking, and schizophrenic at hyperlevels. The dopamine receptor gene on chromosome 11 has a copy number repeats, uh, where the greater the number, the less effective the receptor is at capturing dopamine. Too much dopamine may explain what, uh, what drives people, parachutists, to jump off of skyscrapers, or what causes people in barrels to go over Niagara Falls. I bet you Dr. Carlson never expected that his discovery of dopamine would come to jewelry, cartoons, and tattoos, but they have. Um, Autism, in some cases, derives from too much dopamine. Um, autistic uh, symptoms can appear during infancy, uh, when the baby won't hold eye contact with its mother and doesn't want to be held. A little older, and they remain emotionless, except for fits of rage when the compulsive routines they have are disruptive. As adolescents, they don't seek kindness from others, nor do they show it. They usually have difficulties with language. In, uh, uh, autism went unnamed until 1938 when Hans Asperger in Vienna coined the term meaning self, though the wild boy of Avignon uh, fits the symptomatic description. Um, Uh, the wild boy um, was a lost child of the French Revolution. Uh, he was about, he survived in the wilderness alone somehow for about seven years. And when he was 12 years old, he came into town by his own accord and was taken in by a young uh, physician named Jean Attard, uh, who named the boy Victor. Uh, curiously, Victor became a kind of celebrity in the European Enlightenment as natural philosophers speculated over qualities that distinguish people from animals. Attard specifically looked for language ability and empathy in Victor. He found some evidence, but not much of either. Carl Linnaeus speculated that Victor might belong to another species, Homo ferus, a feral human. Rousseau and Descartes dug for deeper um, uh, evidence of humanness in Descartes' famous line, I think, therefore I am. But in Victor's case, the philosophers who found wisdom in nature did not find it in him um, as a reasoning human being who could be civilized. 
He was a kind of sub, subhuman, though above the animals. Well, so what? Well, so what is that this interpretation of people being just above the animals is a driver of a long history of exploitation of colonial peoples. Victor died in Paris at age 42. Psychiatrists have observed that people who achieve a self-satisfying status through their work or social achievements have correspondingly high levels of serotonin. This has been found in animal studies, too. Uh, a reversal of status, um, perhaps diminishing self-esteem, lowers serotonin. Similarly, nurturing autistic children can help ameliorate behavior by lowering dopamine levels. A few years before Arvid Carlson identified dopamine as a neurotransmitter, Johns Hopkins University psychiatrist Leo Kanner, this is Hans Osberger, by the way, over here, this is Leo Kanner, the psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, um, who proposed that autism was rooted in a genuine lack of ma maternal warmth. This became known as the refrigerator mother theory, um, which other psychiatrists fanned into thinking that autism was a parenting disorder. In some cases, it may have been an abusive parent who humiliated or intimidated a, a child, especially a child who was born somewhere on the natural spectrum of autism, could have had genes switched on and off by the disorder. Refrigerator mothers and fathers could have been autistics themselves. By the 1980s, however, research about neurotransmitters and the organization of parents with autistic children into advocacy groups and foundations, rebalance the interpretation to nature and nurture. Nature provides the genes. Nurture affects the gene expression levels. Earlier, I mentioned Thomas Meeks and Dilip Jest's literature review, um, in which they define wisdom as a composite of six components, pro-social, uh, attitudes and behaviors, social decision-making and pragmatic knowledge of life, emotional homostasis, uh, reflection, self-understanding, value relativism and tolerance, and acknowledgement of, uh, acknowledgement of and dealing effectively with uncertainty. If this holds up, we can define autism as the thief of wisdom. Severely autistic children show none of these traits. In fact, they are the polar opposites. You'll recall that I said Richard Dawkins proposed the selfish gene where natural selection gave a survival advantage to, to selfish genes that were best adapted to their environment. Christopher Wells wrote about, Christopher Wills wrote about the wisdom of the genes, which is close to Daw Dawkins' argument. Uh, they're common ground being wellness abetting survival. Still, how could selfish genes end up supporting a kind of altruism, selflessness, that Meeks and Dilip define as wisdom? On the last page of his book, um, Dawkins backed off a little bit on this, this selfishness um, interpretation because he saw that genes had both long-term and short-term uh, objectives. Um, a short-term gain could inhibit a long-term one, such as might arise between an illness and aging. Uh, aging is not simply an accumulation of wear and tear on cells. Illness and aging involve two distinct processes, though they are linked by the finite number of cell divisions. But in either case, cell function is distributed um, cell function in a distributed but highly connected network. Um, Dawkins characterized this, um, th this altruism of genes as a conspiracy of doves, where genes give up a bit of their innate short-term selfishness for the long-term advantage of wellness. 
Summing up the molecular um, inference of well, wellness comes to this, a wisdom comes to this. Will, wisdom is a human trait upon which natural selection creates evolutionary pathways from the molecular biology of the gene to the cellular organization of the, the nervous system to the physical functioning of the brain. And the transit is a two-way street. Um, that is, wisdom, like neurobiology itself, is both scientifically and socially constructed. Wisdom and wellness are equivalent. They are a selection advantage at every level. Molecular wellness is innate, though often compromised because selection is blind. In wellness and wisdom, neurobiology in the last half century has accomplished something big, like putting a man on the moon. The achievements have been breathtaking. But the moon is a baby step from the earth in the vastness of the universe. So too is knowledge of the brain in the vastness of the mind. Well, let me turn now to the, to the notion of a uh, frontier thesis of the brain. Okay. Um, a frontier thesis of the brain has to ask, uh, what are the pathways um, to consciousness and, and mental performance? Um, we need to discover new ways of carrying out that exploration. And we have to ask how, the, uh, how discovery will change the pioneers and those who follow. Um, the first question I would ask about this is, what is the pathway to personalized predictive medicine? This is a, a um, genetic study of medulloblastomas. Um, in children, um, see, there's the medulloblastoma. Uh, it's a deadly um, uh, tumor in children. Um, it can be surgically removed, but the surgeons always wonder whether it's been entirely removed and won't come back again, or it will come back again. Wouldn't you like to know which is which? Well, this is a, a gene chip study of medulloblastoma involving 87 genes that are expressed differentially. The red, I'm sorry, that's so hard to read. Um, red means a higher level of expression. Um, green means a lower level of expression. Black means no expression. And what you can see here are two distinct groups. Uh, there are 23 uh, columns here, and each column is a child. Um, these nine um, are medulloblastomas that um, will come back and the child has to go through an extremely difficult uh, chemotherapy and radiation. Um, these, these others, these 14, um, are children who have had their tumors removed and they won't come back. And wouldn't you, if you were a doctor, having opened a child's brain, like to be able to say, it's over. Go home and have a happy life. Well, this is how you could do it, using a gene chip and producing um, uh, results like that. Um, I think I'm going to skip a couple of things here. I hate to skip this picture of a benevolent society um, with uh, a black emergency uh, room team taking care of a Ku Klux Klan um, uh, lunatic uh, there on the operating table, but we'll just have to do that another time. Um, uh, Ed mentioned uh, gene therapy, and I'd like to tell you a gene therapy story that I'm uh, fairly familiar with. Um, in March of 1993, uh, Kevin Klug, uh, standing there, had a 30-day life expectancy from a uh, glioblastoma that had come back several times. Um, the researchers at NIH constructed a viral vector. Um, I don't ha actually have it here, but it's very much like, like the second one over here. Um, 
This was the Maloney murine leukemia virus, which was also used in Kevin's case, uh, where the genes for the leukemia uh, were cut out and the long terminal repeats of the virus uh, were left. And in place was um, pasted in a gene from herpes simplex. It was the thymidine kinase gene. And so you have a retrovirus that will infect div dividing cells in the brain um, and carry in the thymidine kinase gene. Well, what in fact this turned out to be was a way of giving tumor cells cold sores. You know that, that herpes simplex causes cold sores. Um, well, that's what they did. Uh, they injected that virus into his brain, uh, into the vascular bread, bed of the tumor that had been removed, uh, and then treated him with gancyclovir. And instead of a 30-day life expectancy, this was Kevin last summer, uh, 21 years out uh, from his uh, terrible ordeal. Um, that might be a lesson to you for your own careers. If you face an illness that can't be resolved, that's just a black box, figure out how to change the illness into a disease that you can treat. Um, I think Ed, actually Ed is an, an authority on neural implants. Uh, probably, I'm, am I giving you too much credit, Ed? I don't think so. Um, uh, this, is, this is a technology that really will change our lives, I, I believe. Um, but there's a great deal of fear about this kind of work. And the fear is well-founded. Uh, between... In the 1970s, I've forgotten the exact dates, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States carried out a program called um, MKUltra. That's not the rock band of that name. It was a, um, it was a, um, a government-sponsored mind control program involving uh, all kinds of, of technologies and torture. Um, there were 149 projects uh, farmed out secretly to almost every major re neurological research center in the United States. Um, and it was eventually revealed. That's actually the first page of the proposal of the MK um, uh, Ultra uh, project. Um, all the papers were ordered destroyed, um, but they, some survived. Now, um, this is a neural implant that was put into the brain of Kathy Hend uh, Henderson, um, a 42-year-old uh, single mother of two who had a brain st um, stem stroke that left her in what's called uh, locked-in syndrome. She could uh, perceive everything that was happening ar around her, but couldn't move anything until a researcher at Brown University figured out how to create a 96 electrode implant that was put into the top of her skull, into her brain. And I wish I had the, the uh, YouTube video that shows Kathy um, drinking from that mug of coffee uh, simply by thinking, uh, and the thoughts moved the robotic arm. Um, uh, I'll just say one thing about this. Um, all the great technologies that science has produced are going to wither on the vine of history unless they can be put into the hands of astute physicians who can translate them into effective um, uh, therapies for, for individuals. This is the most uh, astute physician I've ever met who runs a little clinic in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where patients arrive by horse and buggy to have their genes sequenced, their proteins arrayed, um, and um, it's also the only medical clinic that I know of that has completely reversed mortality uh, figures from 100% to 0% uh, in five different 
uh, amino acidemia, acidemias. Um, well, I'll turn the frontier thesis over to you. You might explore how wisdom can open subconsciousness to manipulation. You can search for unknown neuromicrogenes hidden in the larger genes. You could chart out what appears to be close parallel, uh, parallels between creative inspiration and bipolar disorder. You can map the mind with com computer-generated images of thoughts. You can discover new diseases in previously undiagnosed territory. You might even be able to invent computational consciousness, put it into a rocket, and send it off to explore the first light of the universe, which incidentally was just discovered last month. It's the first trillionth of a trillionth of a second of light that has been traveling at the speed of light for the last 13.8 billion years, and last month it was perceived for the first time. Well, your frontier will lead you in many directions, but eventually you'll come to a fork in the road. And so I'll leave you with a line from American poet Robert Frost in The Road Not Taken. He said, two, wo two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. Thank you. <laughs>